Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Thursday, August 13th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. The joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so you shall drive them away. As wax melts before fire, so the wicked shall perish before God. But the righteous shall be glad. They shall exult before God. They shall be jubilant with joy. Sing to God, sing praises to his name. Lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord, exalt before him. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home, he leads out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Our New Testament reading tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer. But then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of this call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a slave when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a slave is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. 
So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is the second half of Article 2 from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession on Original Sin. We are right in our description of original sin when we say that it is not being able to believe God and not being able to fear and love God. We are right when we say that it includes concupiscence, which seeks fleshly things contrary to God's word. This means when it seeks not only the pleasure of the body, but also fleshy wisdom and righteousness. Therefore, it holds God in contempt when it trusts in these as good things. It is not only the ancient teachers, but even the more recent teachers at least the wiser ones among them, who teach that original sin is both the defects I have mentioned and concupiscence. Thomas Aquinas says, Original sin includes the loss of original righteousness, and with this a disorderly arrangement of the parts of the soul. Therefore it is not pure loss, but a corrupt habit. Bonaventure says, When the question is asked what is original sin, the correct answer is that it is immoderate concupiscence. The correct answer is also that it is a lack of righteousness that is due, and in one of these replies the other is included. This is also Hugo's opinion when he says that original sin is ignorance in the mind and concupiscence in the flesh. He is saying that when we are born we bring with us ignorance of God, unbelief, distrust, contempt, and hatred of God. When he mentions ignorance, he includes these other things. These opinions also agree with Scripture. Paul sometimes clearly calls it a defect, as in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. In another place, he calls it concupiscence, at work in our members to bear fruit for death, Romans 7.5. We could cite more passages relating to both parts, but when a fact is so clear, there is no need of future testimonies. The intelligent reader realizes easily that to be without the fear of God and without faith are more than actual guilt. They are abiding defects in our unregenerate nature. When it comes to original sin, we hold nothing different from either Scripture or the Church Catholic. And I'll just pause there really quickly. You're going to hear this phrase, um, actual sins, as opposed to uh, concupiscence, as opposed to uh, original sin. So actual sins are, are sins that you act out. Um, and that phrase is going to come up quite a bit. So they're not making different degrees of, of sin. They're talking about uh, the sin you're born with, original sin, and then actual sin, the sins you commit in your day-to-day -day life. Um, rather, we cleanse from corruptions and restore to light the most important declarations of Scripture and the Fathers, which have been covered over by the sophistry and controversies of the theologians of our day. It is more than clear that modern theologians do not notice what the fathers mean when they speak about a defect. The knowledge of original sin is absolutely necessary. The magnitude of Christ's grace cannot be understood unless our diseases are recognized. Christ says in Matthew 9.12 and Mark 2.17, those who are well have no need of a physician. The entire notion that a person is righteous is mere hypocrisy before God. We must acknowledge that our heart is by nature destitute of fear, love, and confidence in God. For this reason, the prophet Jeremiah says, After I was instructed, I slapped my thigh. I was ashamed, and I was confounded. 31.19 Likewise, I said in my alarm, All mankind are liars. Psalm 116.11 That is, they do not think correctly about God. Here our adversaries attack Martin Luther because he wrote that original sin remains after baptism. They add that this point was justly condemned by Leo X. But his imperial majesty will discover a clear slander on this point. Our adversaries know in what sense Luther intended this remark, that original sin remains after baptism. Luther always writes that baptism removes the guilt of original sin, however the material, as they call it, of the sin, concupiscence, remains. He also adds that the Holy Spirit given through baptism begins to put to death the concupiscence and begins to create new movements within a person. Augustine speaks in the same way when he says, Sin is forgiven in baptism, 
not in such a way that it no longer exists, but so that it is not charged. Here he confesses openly that sin exists. It remains, although it is not counted against us any longer. Augustine's judgment on this point was so agreeable to those who came after him that it is often quoted in the decrees of church councils. In Against Julian, Augustine says, The law which is in the members has been overturned by spiritual regeneration and remains in the mortal flesh. It has been overturned because the guilt has been forgiven in the sacrament by which believers are born again, but it remains because it produces desires against which believers struggle. Our adversaries know that Luther believes and teaches this, and since they cannot deny this, they instead try to pervert its words in an effort to crush an innocent man. They argue that concupiscence is a penalty, but not a sin. Luther maintains that it is a sin. It has been said above that Augustine defines original sin as concupiscence. If they don't like this, let them argue with Augustine. Besides, Paul says in Romans 7, 7, I would not have known what it is to covet, concupiscence, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Likewise, I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, Romans 7, 23. No amount of sophistry can overthrow these points. They clearly all call concupiscence sin, which is not charged against those who are in Christ, Romans 8, 1 although by nature it is deserving of death, Romans 6.23, where it is not forgiven. All controversies aside, this is what the fathers believe. Augustine, in a long discussion, refutes the opinion of those who think that concupiscence in a person is not a fault, but merely an incidental and inconsequential matter, just as color of the body or ill health is said to be an adiaphron. But when our adversaries argue that the evil inclination is an adiaphron, not only many passages of scripture, but simply the entire church contradict them. Who has ever dared to say that the following things, even if in perfect agreement, could not be reached, are in different matters? Doubt about God's wrath, his grace, God's word, anger at the judgments of God, being provoked because God does not at once deliver one from afflictions, murmuring because the wicked enjoy a better fortune than the good, to be urged on by wrath, lust, the desire for glory, wealth, and so on. Godly people acknowledge these things in themselves as appears in the Psalms and the Prophets. But in the scholastic academies, they took from philosophy entirely different ideas. Desires and inclinations are neither good nor evil, neither praiseworthy nor worthy of blame. Likewise, that sin is only sin if it is a voluntary action. Philosophers were expressing such ideas about civil righteousness, not about God's judgment. They unwisely add other ideas as well, saying that nature is not evil. Properly understood, we do not reject this idea, but it is not right to take this understanding of what God creates as good and apply it to original sin. This is precisely what we read in the works of the scholastics, who wrongly mingle philosophy or civil teachings about ethics with the gospel. These matters were not only disputed in the schools, but, as is usually the case, were carried from the schools to the people. These teachings prevailed and nourished confidence in human strength and suppressed the knowledge of Christ's grace. Therefore, Luther wanted to declare how great the consequences of original sin are and how weak human beings are as a result. So he taught that these remnants of original sin after baptism are not by nature adiaphora in people, but that we need Christ's grace so that they are not counted against us as sin and to put them to death, mortify them, we need the Holy Spirit, Romans 8.13. The scholastics minimize sin and punishment when they teach that people can fulfill God's commandments under their own power. But in Genesis, the punishment imposed because of original sin is described differently. For there, human nature is subjected not only to death and other bodily evils, but also to the devil's kingdom. In Genesis 3.15, there is this fearful sentence that proclaims, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Defects and concupiscence are both sin and punishment. Death and other bodily evils in the dominion of the devil are properly understood to be punishments. Human nature has been delivered into slavery and is held captive by the devil. Colossians 1.13 He fills human nature with a passionate desire for wicked opinions and errors and pushes it to sins of every kind. Just as the devil cannot be conquered except by Christ's help, so we cannot free ourselves from this slavery by our own strength. World history shows how great and powerful the devil's kingdom is, 
The world is full of blasphemies against God and wicked opinions. The devil keeps all tied up keeps all tied up many hypocrites who appear holy and who are wise and righteous in the world's eyes. Even greater vices are seen in other people, since Christ was given to us to remove both these sins and these punishments, and to destroy the devil's kingdom, sin and death. 1 John 3.8 We will never be able to recognize Christ's benefits unless we understand our evils. For this reason, our preachers have diligently taught all about these things. They have not delivered anything that is new, but have set forth Holy Scripture in the judgment of the Holy Fathers. We think this will satisfy His Imperial Majesty about the childish, childish and trivial sophistry the adversaries used to pervert our article on original sin. We know that we believe correctly, in harmony with the Church Catholic of Christ. If the adversaries renew this controversy, there will be more than enough of us to reply and to defend the truth. In this case, our adversaries, to a great extent, do not understand what they are saying. They often speak in a contradictory way and do not explain either correctly or logically what is the essence of original sin and what they call a defect. We are unwilling here to examine their arguments in any further subtle detail. We think it is worthwhile just to recite, in customary and well-known words, the belief of the Holy Fathers, which we also follow. And tomorrow evening we will do Article 3 on Christ and then the beginning of Article 4 on Justification, which is the big one in the Apology. Article 4, Justification by Faith, by Grace through Faith, for Christ's sake alone. Uh, that, that's the longest article uh, and the most detailed treatment that we'll see. Now we join in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But ah, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride. Your holy vineyard is trampled, and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people, for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance, and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine which you once established for yourself, and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood, and let all your faithful people ever be found in the Apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread, and in the prayers. We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stay far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgment. O eternal High Priest, let the fruit of your Spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward one another to the glory of your holy name here in time, and hereafter in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Most gracious God, we give thanks for the joy and blessings that you grant to husbands and wives. Assist them always by your grace, that with true fidelity and steadfast love they may honor and keep their marriage vows, grow in love toward you and for each other, and come at last to the eternal joys that you have promised. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.